we are ready to start. I'm seeing some nodding heads. Okay, well, um, first of all, it's a great honor to be able to address you today and have a conversation about a topic that is unpleasant and sad and tragic on, uh, in two ways. One is that it's centered on realism, which is an approach to international relations that often focuses on things that are tragic. And it is also on, of course, a tragic war, the war that Russia unleashed upon Ukraine. Um, my talk today is going to be about what trying to help understand why uh, scholars and experts who ex espouse realism or claim that they are realists, why they say what they do say about this war, why they understand the war the way they do. And as you can see on the, uh, the second slide, so after the title slide, we have a kind of introductory slide where I'm going to try to explain how realists answer five questions. I'm gonna do it relatively quickly, although Sergei has told me not to talk too fast. That's very hard for me to do. I tend to talk too fast, but I'll try to keep it slow. And those questions are why the United States and the West on the one hand and Russia on the other hand found themselves in an antagonistic rivalry situation? What explains the spiral in geopolitical tensions between Russia and the West? The second question is why ultimately did Russia choose a large scale war in response to the situation that it faced? What do realists say about that choice? The third is what are the stakes, which means what are the various sides trying to get in this conflict? How do realists understand these interests that are being fought out over the conflict? The fourth is how big a danger is the threat of escalating to an entirely new level of war, whether it be an escalation in terms of the amount of violence that is used or spreading the war beyond its current bounds. What are those risks? And finally, given all of these first four things, what do realists say we, by which I mean the United States, because I'm reporting to you on what realists in the United States are saying, what should the United States do in these circumstances? How do they evaluate US policy towards the conflict? So that's where I'm going, five key points. And now I'll move to the next slide, which is a very short introduction to the whole subject of realism and the Ukraine war. And I'm just gonna take a few minutes to say what I think realism actually is. Now, of course, I've written I, probably, I don't even know how many articles and books about the subject, um, but I think it can be boiled down uh, rather, rather simply to begin the, um, yeah. Oh, so you, um, I'm sorry, you're not seeing my presentation. Got it. Okay. So I need to share my screen. Is that correct? I thought I get it. Okay. My apologies. Let me get that going. Share screen, start slides. Thank you for that note. I now have to find the Ukrainian version. One second. Here we go. And we will share our screen. My apologies. Now I'm hoping you are seeing- We can see. Very good, thank you. So here's the title slide, which I've already gone over. this slide a, um, a picture of an article written by one very well-known realist, jo John Mearsheimer. Um, and the question asked there is, why do people hate realism so much? And the reason I have that on there is because the way the realists answer these five questions is very controversial and thus has attracted a huge amount of criticism directed at realists and at realism because of the way they've answered these questions. Okay, 
Now I will get to where we were on the slides, which is an introduction. Uh, two minutes on realism. And that is simply a uh, to stress that realism is a complicated school of thought or intellectual approach to understanding international politics. It is not a monolithic single theory. It comprises a large number of different theories, propositions, you might even say attitudes towards the subject of international politics. What gives unity to this school of thought is a shared set of assumptions about how the world works. And from these assumptions, realists derive a kind of distinctive approach to thinking about international relations and uh, a set of theories. Now, not all of these theories agree. So you can have, you can derive from a single set of assumptions, theories that are different. Uh, nonetheless, there's a kind of family resemblance among these theories. What are those assumptions upon which realists build their arguments, their theories? Fundamentally, I think there are three. Um, the first one is an assumption that human beings or human groups tend to operate in their own self-interest. In other words, there is a skepticism about universal values, uh, a skepticism about uh, um, the possibility of making the world into a harmonious place. It's the human beings or groups of humans that interact tend to operate on their own self-interest, no matter what they might say. The second is an assumption about um, the nature of power, namely that power is central to all politics. And so when you observe something going on in the world, realists say, look behind the words, look behind the fancy phrases that politicians use and look for the realities of power, domination, control, the use of power to get what agents want in international relations. And the final assumption is that international politics is really a business between groups of people rather than individuals. In other words, groups are central. And in this current world, the most important group is the state, or what is sometimes called a nation state, countries, states. And so realists tend to look at relations amongst states they tend to assume that states act in their own self-interest, and they tend to believe that power is very important in understanding what those states do and what happens when they interact. And that kind of gets to one of the, that brings us to one of the features of realism, which is tendency to focus on so-called great powers or major powers. And, uh, and in the particular case of the war that Russia uh, unleashed upon Ukraine, even though this is a war of Russia against Ukraine, realists tend to focus on Russia's role as a great power in understanding that war, and indeed on Russia's relations with the wider West. Okay, so those are my two or three minutes on realism, but I hope that I have convinced you that it's a very broad approach and therefore cannot be reduced to a single realist, however famous that realist might be. Pictured on this slide, is a Chicago professor by the name of John Mearsheim. In 2015, after your country was invaded by Russia for the first time in 2014, in 2015, he gave a speech at the University of Chicago on why the crisis in Ukraine is the West's fault. That speech has been downloaded and viewed from YouTube almost 30 million times. In other words, he's the world's most famous realist, and he's the world's most famous realist and most controversial realist when it comes to the Russian war in Ukraine. However, he does not represent all realists. In fact, there's a great deal of diversity in this school of thought, and so we don't want to reduce or concentrate, uh, I should say, we don't want to equate this one scholar with all realist thought. That said, um, what I'm doing today in the rest of this talk is reporting my understanding of typical or average common standard realist analysis. I am not reporting my own views. Strangely, as it may sound, I think of myself as a realist, but I find myself in disagreement with 
typical realists. So that we can discuss if you're interested. Maybe it's not interesting, but I don't agree with a, most of what I'm with a lot of what I'm about to say. However, I do believe I am reporting to you accurately what most realists in the United States are saying today about this war. Okay, that's the introduction. Now we will move to the next slide and the um, the first question, which is trying to how realists understand and explain the origins of the spiraling tensions between Russia and the West, which went from something close to partnership in the 1990s to being key ge geopolitical adversaries today. Um, and I have placed on this slide four common explanations, and I have highlighted or put in bold face two of them that are consistent with realist theory. Um, the first and by far most sort of well-known is the argument that I already referred to that John Hemersheimer makes. That fundamentally, it's the fault of the West, that the West, especially the United States, threatened Russia by consistently, irreversibly, inexorably expanding its security and economic in institutions ever closer to the Russian border. Um, and the reasons for the expansion of these institutions, but especially NATO, according to this view, were not really about the security of the United States or the West. They were expanding towards Russia in, for ideological reasons or domestic political reasons. In other words, they argue the fundamental source of tension come from within the West in a kind of expansionist drive that emanates from liberal ideas. That liberalism is a political philosophy and a political system that always feels insecure unless the whole world becomes liberal. And so it's always wanting to expand. And so interestingly, even though realists tend to focus on the international system as an explanation, in the case of the Ukraine, of the, in the case of the Russia West spiral, their focus is very much inside the borders of Western countries and especially the United States. So in this story, Russia is basically reacting to an aggressive and expansionistic West. The second possible explanation is that actually the reason we have this antagonism is primarily the fault of Russia. Russia has turned into an, a bellicose actor, geopolitically active and aggressive, not because Russia is insecure, but because of domestic politics and the autocratic regime in Russia, which again, is in a mirror image of the first view. In this view, autocracies like Putin's never can feel secure in a world of democracies. And what scares Russia in this view is not the military power of the West, it's the institutions, the freedom, um, and the transparency imposed by the West on what is fundamentally a autocratic criminal regime. And so to understand this antagonism, according to this view, you look inside Russia, not inside the West. And this is espoused mainly by uh, liberals in the international relations scholarly context, and probably the best known exponent of this view is Michael McFaul, the former US ambassador to Russia under the Obama administration. There is a third view, which is at least logically possible, but nobody argues it, which is actually both sides are at fault and the reasons they are aggressive toward each other lie in the domestic politics of each side. But that view is not really represented as far as I can tell in the academic discourse. The final view is that actually it's neither side's fault in strictly speaking that both Russia and the West are just trying to secure themselves. They really don't intend to expand against each other. They don't mean to be aggressive towards each other. They just want to feel secure, but the things they do to secure themselves end up threatening to the other side. So in this instance, for example, the argument is, well, there were good reasons for expanding NATO. NATO helped to pacify lots of potential problems in Europe. NATO wasn't even necessarily directed against the Soviet Union. NATO was really an effort to solve problems that could have emerged in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet empire. So we had reasons for expanding NATO for security, but they weren't meant 
and intended at all uh, against Russia. Russia had nothing to fear from NATO. Whereas on the Russian side, the argument is, we feel insecure when powerful Western institutions come near our borders. We feel that valuable strategic territory right next to us becomes part of NATO, that that will be used to threaten us and coerce us. Therefore, we oppose it. The argument in the fourth explanation for this antagonism is has a name in the scholarly discourse. It's called the security dilemma. And interestingly, this fourth view is kind of more consistent with most realist scholarship, yet not that many realists actually apply it to this crisis. They tend to be much more attracted to the first view, blaming the West for the fallout, the antagonism, the spiral of tension between Russia and the West. Okay, so now we've got how realists answer the first question. And again, you've already noticed a bit of a contradiction that it's kind of a, 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 an explanation rooted in, based in domestic politics as opposed to the international system. Now we move on um, to the second big question. Uh, well, not to, oh, I actually, I interspersed some slides here to note, I wanted to illustrate what this means in terms of what realists say about this particular uh, um, antagonism between Russia and the West, which is there's, in, in trying to spell out the story of why Russia is so bellicose or why Russia has become more antagonistic towards the West, there are three major narratives, one focused on insecurity, one focused on the breakup of the empire, the Russian and then Soviet empire, and the third focused on the autocratic illiberal political system that Putin has built in Russia. And um, I have highlighted the insecurity story because um, that is what realists focus on in explaining Russian behavior. It's a corollary or consequence of the first explanation that I uh, discussed just previously about why Russia and the West are uh, have become uh, enemies. And the argument here is that uh, is that basically to put it bluntly, what realists tend to say is that any great power on the territory presently occupied by the Russian Federation would feel insecure by, by the expansion of a hostile military and now uh, uh, alliance near its borders. Um, so they do not place much emphasis at all on the imperial story or on the autocracy story, which tends to be much more emphasized in the work of people who actually know a lot about Russia, people who study the region, people who study Russian history and Russian politics. Um, so what we tend to see in, the, in history, I, I think, is kind of a combination of these three explanations for Russian expansionism, in that the, the Russian rulers in St. Petersburg or Moscow always feel like they want to have friendly neighbors, neighbors that will be accommodating to them. But the problem that Russia has always faced is its relative backwardness as, as an eco economy and its relative unattractiveness as a political system it means that its neighbors often really don't want to be friendly to Russia. They want to be friendly to the countries to the West. Um, and therefore the tool that Russian rulers reach for to make their neighbors friendly uh, tends to be military capability. And so you tend to have situations such as the one portrayed on this slide where the Russian Empire before World War II, I'm uh, sorry, the Russian Empire before World War I had expended itself all the way to the center of Europe. Uh, and it kept that position largely through coercion. Obviously there were other parts of it, but largely through coercion. And then people my age very much remember the Cold War version of this friendly neighbors problem that Russia always faces, where again, its power uh, extended all the way uh, to the Elbe River in the center of Germany, um, but it couldn't really hold this territory through the power of attraction or the attractiveness of its economy. It held it mainly through military power and the use of the Communist Party as a kind of lever or tool for domination. And so the current world from this perspective is strange or scary, you might say, or different from the standpoint of 400 years of Russian imperial history in that um, it has um, 
lost this capacity uh, to win or dominate neighbors. And therefore the West has moved closer to it than it has been historical norm. And um, realists basically, um, sorry, uh, you know, guys, I make a big mistake. I failed to, to move the slides again. Um, so I'm very sorry for that. So here's a slide I was talking from when I mentioned the Russian empire expansion. And here's the slide I was talking about with the Cold War version, getting at this problem that Russia has consistently through history of, um, of its um, desire to have friendly neighbors, but its lack of the, of the attributes that would attract them other than military capability. And brought us to this slide. So I have to be very careful about moving these slides because I have the English version on another computer. So that's what's causing this problem. Um, so realists basically look at the current uh, uh, story that Russia tells of its own insecurity and basically accept it. They tend to accept uh, the view that Russian opposition to NATO expansion and, and, it, and the extension of European Western security institutions close to the border of Russia, they tend to accept those as rational or normal behavior by a great power. And that is a very important source of everything else I'm about to say, that, that assumption that Russia is behaving in a predictable way for any great power. Okay, um, so what this means is, is that um, uh, to move to the next slide, um, that there is dis they discount all of the evidence coming from Moscow about the imperial story, the imperial narrative. Whenever they read or interpret a speech by Putin, they just ignore all the stuff. They don't tend to focus on the, the language that sounds like imperial speech, sounds like it doesn't think of Ukraine like any other country, but thinks of Ukraine in some sort of imperial way. They discount that in favor of this security, insecurity narrative. And on the next slide, uh, we see the natural uh, corollary of how realists think, which is to discount the, the autocratic or domestic politics story. In other words, realists tend not to be very clear of what they mean when they say insecurity. Uh, many people think the insecurity, as I mentioned before, derives from the regime or the, uh, the, 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 the auto autocratic government's sense of security rather than any Russian national security in a general sense. And they discount also explanations that focus on the insecurity of the ruler of Russia, Vladimir Putin. After all, we have a highly personalistic type of government in Russia, Putin, Putin, Putin 24 seven. And many people when they look at this war would go to the, to the sense of insecurity that might be felt by the ruler of Russia. But realists tend to discount all of that for the reason I just stated. They tend to folk, they tend to argue that Russia's violent reaction to the expansion of Western institutions close to its border is, they argue, typical behavior for a great power. Okay, so we will move much more quickly. Yeah, there are a lot of words on this slide, but I will uh, get through them rapidly as we move through these remarks. Um, so then we get to the question of, it's one thing to explain why Russia and the West have become antagonists. It's quite another to explain why uh, Russia chose a war, uh, a large war, a big war, uh, one of the biggest wars in the post-World War II era, why he chose a war in response to this circumstance. Um, it's important to note that realists tend to see NATO expansion as an important background condition. It doesn't explain everything, but they argue, I think, that had NATO not been threatening to expand to Ukraine, uh, that Russia would have been less likely or Putin would have been less likely to invade. Um, they um, also recognize that the formal expansion of NATO, or they argue that the formal agreement state to state between Kiev and Brussels to join the alliance is only part of the story. 
They also stress other forms of military and security cooperation that was emerging between Ukraine and the NATO. So that in some sense, they argue, the debate over the formal alliance is less important than what was happening on the ground. To put this differently, many realists accept some of what Russian spokespeople say when they say that Ukraine was on a path to becoming a member of NATO, in fact, if not formally or legally. So they accept that as a background condition. If you look at what realists advocated for or argued publicly in the lead up to the war, they tended to urge concessions on NATO expansion and published articles and opinion pieces saying that the West should agree to a formal uh, agreement of, neutra of Ukrainian neutrality um, in the diplomacy that occurred prior to February. That is to say, realists did not accept every diplomatic proposal the Russian foreign ministry put forward in those uh, months leading up to the invasion, but they were on the side of trying to make some concessions to Russia. They discount much of the evidence that we now have that Russia was never actually uh, serious about those negotiations. In explaining why, though, the war was the ultimate choice, you see a convergence between realist thinking and the rational explanations of war um, that Professor Richard Jordan lectured about previously. Namely, they argue that in an international system where there's no higher authority to enforce any deal that states make, there is a problem of whether you should trust a commitment made by your negotiating partner. And in this case, they say, one thing that uh, the Russian authorities could never be certain of was whether any agreement they signed regarding preventing the expansion of NATO into Ukraine could be uh, would would be upheld, whether the signatories to such an agreement would abide by it in the future. And as Jordan suggested in his lecture, one way of solving that problem is just to use force and and take the thing. Just take it. That way you don't have to negotiate about it. The other problem that realists also accept that is consistent with the so-called rational bargaining model of war is that actors can never know before they fight what the balance of power actually is. The problem of imperfect information or uncertainty. So that's also important to realists in explaining why states choose to fight. They fight sometimes because they think they can do better than they actually turn out to be able to do. So they, they, they misestimate or, uh, the, the, the likelihood that military power will get them what they want. And those two issues clearly would be important in any realist explanation for why the Russian president thought that war was a way to solve the problems that he thought he had to his West. However, with the exception of the person I mentioned earlier, John Mearsheimer, almost all realists accept that this war was a war of choice. There was not necessitated. It was a it was a a clear choice by Russia to do this thing. It wasn't imposed on Russia by the security problems that I've just discussed. In other words, almost all realize, realists believe that there were other ways Russia could have tried to handle the insecurity that it says it faces um, in its relations with Europe and with the West. They don't believe that realism in some sense predicts this war as the only and unique response to Moscow's security problems. And indeed, most recognize that it's a huge blunder. In fact, you know, realists have been writing for years about how the United States itself undertook very, very mistaken policies when it invaded countries. When you invade a country, you come up against the problem of nationalism, that group identity. And many realists stress this in criticizing their own country's foreign policy, policy foreign policy of the United States in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Invading and occupying countries is a dangerous business. So most of them are not defending Putin's war as like a smart idea 
or a rational choice. They're just trying to explain how it is that we got to this point where it seemed like a possible solution to the political problems that uh, that the um, Russian president thought he faced. Okay, so all of that is giving you a sense of where realists are coming from on the question of why, um, why war was chosen. Now we move to the third question, which is the stakes or why, um, what are the interests that are involved of, in all of the sides of this war? And to begin with, we should start by saying that not a single realist has any confusion or problem understanding what Ukraine is fighting for. Everybody knows it's fighting for its existence, it's fighting for its territorial integrity, it's fighting for its sovereignty. So nobody discounts that. What they are trying to understand is what are the stakes of Russia and what are the stakes of Ukraine's supporters, mainly in the collective West. What's in it for them? And understanding how realists think about these, these stakes or the, the interests is important for understanding everything else that they say. Um, and um, I have on this slide in English on the lower left, a uh, article um, that says, what if we're already fighting the third world war? In other words, many in the US and Europe think this war is about the world. It's, 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 it, it, Russia cannot win this war because if Russia wins, there will be a massive blow, not just to Ukraine, but to the whole world as various key principles are destroyed as key precedents about territorial integrity are, are ripped apart and that the West and the liberal world order will be dramatically weakened if Russia comes out of this with anything other than a clear defeat. So that's what that article is about that I have on the lower left. Realists are almost, uh, are very, very uh, consistent in disagreeing with that view. They do not believe the stakes for the West and for the world are that big. And that is an important dividing line between realist analysis and the dominant view in Western capitals. Um, and the reasons for that are kind of spelled out on this slide. Realist theory, remember, is focused on power and group interest and assumes self-interest. And therefore, realists tend to be very skeptical of the idea of a liberal order. They don't think these rules and institutions really constrain um, states very much at all. And so they don't really worry that the outcome of Russia's war in Ukraine is going to affect the liberal order because they don't really believe there is much of a liberal order. They think they see an alliance system run by the United States in its own interest rather than a set of rules and institutions that deserves the name order. They're less concerned about protecting democracy itself as a worldwide institutional phenomena. They, they're focused on the narrow interests of the US state, the US of A, the United States of America. It's not America's job in their view to fight for democracy on the, around the world. Put differently, they think that the world's democracies do not require democracy to spread in order to be secure. They're less worried about the idea of setting a dangerous precedent by allowing Russia to get away with the forceful seizure of territory. They don't think it's good. They don't think Ukraine in a in a proper world would, would have to give up territory. They don't think, they don't like it. However, they do not think that if Russia were to succeed in taking territory away from Ukraine, that somehow that would open up a huge box that would be followed by other states, such as China, one might say, in uh, suddenly deciding to use force to change borders. They think that the existing world is sort of buttressed by power and interest, as I suggested, rather than the idea of rules or norms that can be broken through one state's uh, actions, like what Russia has done. They also think that um, they're not really worried that if Russia comes out of this war 
with something that it might claim as a victory, that somehow that somehow that will put the rest of Europe uh, or NATO at a greater threat. On the contrary, they think this war is weakening Russia, and therefore, as a result, Russia constitutes far less of a threat to the security of um, NATO Europe than, than people used to think. Therefore, they're just not worried that Russia will gain power from this and therefore then become a more threatening actor or a more capable actor in the future. And, and so they're, they're, they're just, they tend to see the stakes as focused on the future of, of Ukraine itself and the future of, of Russia, rather than, inv than involving the security or the fundamental interests of the NATO alliance or especially the United States. And the latter point is particularly important since these realists are not global thinkers. They think the unit of analysis is the state and therefore all of their analysis and all of their policy recommendations are about what is good for the US, not what is good for the world. So all of that is helping to explain why realists caution against saying that the future of the world um, depends upon this um, depends upon this war. And that then uh, brings me to the next slide, which is part, of course, why realists caution against uh, uh, caution against inflating the stakes, which is, well, let me get my control. They are extremely afraid of escalation. And they're worried that if you if you expand the stakes, um, and, 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 and exaggerate what is at stake, that that could, that could um, lead to or contribute to a dangerous escalation of the war. They're worried that one uh, a participant in the war might be worried about defeat and therefore might choose to escalate. So right now, those uh, concerns are focused on Russia, which is losing this war uh, as a result of Ukrainian advances in the previous weeks. And so they're always worried when one side is in danger of losing that it will see an, an incentive to raise the stakes, um, possibly through escalating the war. And right now there is a huge discussion over the possibility that somehow um, Putin will see it in, in his interest as escalating to the use of so-called small yield nuclear weapons. It's still thought of as a very low probability, but it's thought of as a higher probability than it was before. They spill out a lot of different, many different pathways by which escalation could occur. There's intentional escalation where one side says, we're going to raise this war to a new level. But there's also inadvertent non-intentional escalation. Russia strikes some, tries to strike some uh, access route for Western um, military assistance to Ukraine. Something goes wrong. The weapon uh, detonates in a NATO country. NATO feels that it needs to respond. It responds against Russian territory. Then Russia decides that it's going to invoke its doctrine that it can escalate in response to attacks on Russian territory. And you see a spiral of escalation. So they're very, very, very concerned about escalation. But my last bullet point on the slide is the most important one uh, in understanding where realists are coming from. And it's highly contentious. But when you are looking at the 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 understanding who has the most credibility in terms of escalation, the West or Russia. They argue that Russia has more credibility. That is that Russia has a greater incentive to escalate and to accept costs to achieve victory than the West does. Allow me to interject. Nobody doubts that the stakes are greatest for Ukraine. The question is between Russia and the West, however, who's got the most stakes in this conflict? Who cares so much about it that they're willing to risk the most to achieve victory? Realists pretty consistently tend to accept that Russia is more motivated or more highly um, in, in, in interested in the outcome of this war and therefore is willing to accept more costs and more risks in order to prevail. 
they accept Putin's own characterization or Russian spokesperson's characterization of the war as existential for Russia. And I mean, I can give you quotes from very influential realists saying that this is an existential war for Russia. You can see on the lower left in English, a uh, here an article by the, that famous notorious realist Mearsheimer basically saying, uh, the risks of catastrophic escalation are high. And in there, you will see this use of this term existential for the war. Now, many people see this and really are wondering how the war can be existential since the war is not occurring in Russia and Russia's existence as a state is not in question. So here again, to just interject some critical commentary, this failure to distinguish between state security, regime security, and individual leader security is a problem, I think, when realists use this term existential. Um, however, they might argue that who cares? If it's existential for Putin, then he's the one deciding whether to escalate. And therefore, we're worried about escalation. OK, I can see that I have allowed my rate of speech to increase. I'll try to uh, keep it slow for the last slide, which is um, the last slide concerns what is the message that realist scholars and commentators have consistently interjected into the policy debate in the United States. And the fundamental message is restraint in the US uh, stance towards supplying its Ukrainian partners with military capability. Um, and this is, this is what has made them particularly controversial in the existing conversation and the existing debates in the West. This, every time Ukraine starts to do well, every time Russia, uh, Ukrainian arms advance and take more towns, every time the Russians retreat in disarray, realists come out and start saying, oh my gosh, we are going to have an escalation. We need to make sure that we do not give Ukraine the wherewithal or the capability to, um, to do too much damage to Russia. Realists have consistently advocated against the long range rocket systems, the step up from HIMARS that Ukrainians have requested. U US has uh, realists have consistently advocated against the supply of more advanced armor. Um, they have consistently um, uh, advocated against any more direct involvement. And indeed, many uh, realists are on record advocating the United States seek to restrain Ukraine in its own self-defense. That's probably the most controversial of the U realists' recommendations, namely that somehow the uh, United States needs to somehow convince uh, the government in Kiev, their partner uh, Zelensky, that um, that they need to accept some sort of deal with Russia. That the um, the aim of total victory, the complete pushing uh, uh, out of Ukrainian territory of all Russian forces, the um, infliction upon Russia of a humiliating defeat is not, these realists argue, in the interest of the United States, primarily because. They worry about it. They worry about um, the prospects of escalation. And so, uh, with that, you've got my uh, remarks. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, end my screen share if I can here, and um, and um, we can go to a Q and A. I know that um, I've moved relatively quickly, and I know there are many things to discuss. Дякуємо за прекрасну чудову лекцію. Я так розумію, що у нас є до 15 хвилин на питання. І прошу колеги, студентство, хто має бажання задати питання, пану Вільяму, будь ласка. Пан Ігор, будь ласка, давайте. 
So I want to say thank you for the uh, lecture. It is a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, and I want, want to say the uh, main uh, uh, reason why uh, Putin uh, uh, keeps uh, the war because uh, he completes uh, the people's potreby, jak bude nisko mówił. Uh, he uh, makes uh, that what the people want. They want to be great. Uh, he, uh, uh, Russian people uh, want to be great. He want to uh, be great in Ukraine, in Belarus, in the uh, Baltic country, in Poland, and the other uh, countries of uh, Central Europe. And um, you remembered the uh, Soviet Union, and I remembered uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, humor tale uh, about uh, this Amer American human and the Soviet Union. The American uh, human came to White House, if, if I remember, and he said that he doesn't, he is not satisfied on president's activity. And is, uh, and the Soviet uh, human uh, came to uh, main sec secretary uh, and he said uh, that uh, he, he is not satisfied to uh, President Reagan's activity. So it is moral. And uh, I have a question that um, is it depends from Russian people or from Russian regime? Because I know that the uh, Russian people is uh, the Russian regime. If we put in the uh, will uh, defeat the war, they destroy this regime. Because if we, we remember, uh, Russian people organized the uh, revolution uh, when they defeated the war. Uh, remember in 1905, when Russia defeated uh, Japan, and in 1817, when uh, Russia get uh, out from World War one. So is that really that depends from people or not? What do you think? Well, I think there's, there's, yeah, I think there's two, two responses. Um, the first is that um, uh, realists are not experts on Russia, <laughs> mostly. And so they have no particular insight on the fragility of the Putin regime and whether it can withstand defeat. Um, what they would say, again, I want to stress, I'm not giving you my own views. I'm giving you what I understand to be dominant or common views of realists. They are afraid of exactly that possibility, that Putin will worry that the historical precedent of 1905 and 1917, and by the way, I could also add the historical precedent in a way of 1991, because they lost in Afghanistan, they were losing the Cold War, and their leader Mikhail Gorbachev and the entire Soviet Union was thrown out, uh, was overthrown. Um, and so they will worry that he, with that precedent in mind, Putin will be, will be willing to take in very high risks to not lose to prevent a loss in this war. So what you are saying actually feeds this argument that realists tend to make of being very afraid of escalation and therefore urging caution upon the leadership in Washington and by implication the leadership in Kiev, although you know they don't really expect and wouldn't necessarily expect the leader of a country to voluntarily acquiesce to the 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 seizure of territory violently by a by a powerful neighbor but they urge caution for exactly that reason now the second way to answer the question would be well how realistic are these fears or not fears for many of us of course it's hope you know that the russian people would toss this regime out if it lost and i really don't know i think that um the nature of these things is by nature um well, I'll just put it this way. What the political science research tends to show is that street demonstrations don't throw out regimes. Elites, highly placed 
powerful figures or institutions are what overthrow regimes. And so that is by nature something that has to be kept incredibly secret. If, you're, if your idea is you're going to get rid of Putin, the, the, you don't want anybody to know what you're doing. So we can't really know what is going on within the power structure of Russia because these, all the incentives are for it to be kept secret. I will make one comment, however, and that is that he must be very, very, very nervous, not just because he is losing, but because we have human sources within the Russian establishment. There have been published uh, articles in the Western press that appear to be based on very highly placed people in the um, power ministries of the Russian Federation giving inside information about possible dissatisfaction within the power ministries over how that war is being conducted. And so if I were him, I'd be a very nervous guy right now because not only am I losing, but I also know there are people within highly placed in Russia who are talking to Western uh, intelligence um, people. So it's a very, very fraught situation. Understand, thank you. Thank you. Дяк, у нас ще є час для кількох питань. Людмила, будь ласка. Dear dear colleagues, uh, Mr. Williams, thank you very much for your lecture and for your thought due to this uh, problem. I have uh, such question. So um, what do you think uh, if the Russia Federation and of course Putin decides uh, to use nuclear weapons due to Ukraine? What will be the reaction of the United States of America? And uh, your representatives of realism continues to say Ukraine uh, to sit on the table of negotiation, or maybe uh, their position will be changed. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a this is the this is the question of the day. This is the question that everybody is talking about. This is the question that is keeping people awake at night. What exactly will the United States do if Ukraine were to resort to use of what is called a low-yield nuclear weapon? The answer we've gotten from high officials in the U.S. administration is that, of course, it depends. It depends on what they do. It depends on whether this is a demonstration use. It's some sort of test you could imagine near the Ukrainian border, or you could imagine a detonation over the Black Sea, is attempt to show we're serious, or it could be used on what the Russians would say is a military target. Um, and also how big a use, so all of these things are unknown, but clearly the scale of the response. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that. I just heard someone speaking. Um, well, anyway, the scale of the response would partially depend on what they did. But the bottom line is we don't know and that those plans are being kept secret. We had uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, say that these have been communicated to the Russians, uh, not in detail, but the Russians have been told that if they were to cross this threshold, that there would be very, very severe, very, very punishing responses. Some... Some government officials have leaked to the press sort of very general parameters or, or restrictions saying that, well, it might just be a conventional response. We could hit targets within the Russian Federation from which these things were launched. We, we could finally and completely cut Russia off from the world economy. But, um, but no details are forthcoming. So everybody's debating whether there is a way to respond that would not elicit a further escalation from the Russian side. So that's the fundamental uh, question of the day. But anyway, that was a really, that was a great question, which is what everybody's asking. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Дякую. Пані Ірина, давайте у вас буде сьогодні останнє питання, тому що час добігає кінця. Будь ласка. Thank you very much. Thank you for the election. And I want to continue such a question about nuclear factor. 
and uh, some or maybe implement implementation of such a document as Budapest Memorandum. Uh, you say that if if Russia will use uh, tactical nuclear weapons uh, uh, against Ukraine, this is why we can implement the best memorandum when uh, all uh, states that uh, uh, ratificate this memorandum uh, in such a way, maybe sign uh, significate this memorandum, uh, may to um, use their forces to uh, protect Ukraine because they use only weapons uh, against our country. Real. Yes, the um, Budapest Mem Memorandum was an attempt to reassure Ukraine when Ukraine was allowing its uh, the weapons that were on its territory to be transferred to the Russian Federation. And clearly that uh, document is uh, showing the problem that I referred to before of credible commitments. If a state makes a commitment on a piece of paper, how do you enforce it? And how do you know they will abide by it? In technical terms, however, the Budapest, the signatories of that memorandum were giving a what's not security guarantees, but security assurances. So essentially, they were saying that each signatory is 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 committed to respecting this, this the territorial integrity of Ukraine. So the only country that has violated the Budapest memorandum is the Russian Federation. Russian President Yeltsin put his signature on a on a document, and it was approved by the Russian Duma that said, we will respect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And obviously what they've been doing since 2014 is in direct violation of that signature. Um, and so they stand in violation of that treaty. However, I think there is a lot, just to conclude here, there's a lot of people in the world who think that you, you know, that this shows that Ukraine should have held on to its nuclear weapons. And weirdly, interestingly, back in the 1990s, some scholars argued that Ukraine should keep its nuclear weapons. And guess what was the name of one of those scholars? John Mearsheimer, who said, Ukraine should definitely keep its nuclear weapons as that will hold a peace between Ukraine and Russia. So it's, it, I think if I'm understanding correctly, we are out of time. Um, is that correct? Part. Well, Thank you so much for interesting and uh, done, uh, so in informational lection and uh, your time uh, and uh, answers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for, for, for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.